So I just click. <laughs> awesome. Hi, everyone. I'm going to ask you two questions. How many of you have ever felt like you didn't belong? How many of you have ever felt like you weren't accepted? Now, what if I were to tell you that that feeling was part of the magic behind world domination? If you don't believe me, that's fine, because that's exactly what I'm here to do today. So let's rewind a little bit before I get into the meat. I'm an immigrant. I immigrated here when I was five years old. My parents moved us to America from Japan in pursuit of the American dream. It was simple, and when we first got to America, things were pretty normal. You know, you had your friends, you had your random going to the library obsessively because I'm obsessed with books. You had all of these things that comprised of the life of a kid growing up. And then a day happened that changed the life of everyone here, and it changed my life forever. September 11th, 2001. On that day, my childhood as I knew it was gone forever. My mother sat all of us down. I was now the eldest of six. She sat all of us down and she told us that from this day forward, that we would need to be careful of how we behaved and how we reacted in the world because people would be watching us. We were now the representatives of our faith. As a 10-year-old, that is a pretty big realization to make. And it's something that followed me as I grew up. You know, my identity is pretty visible. And in the reality that we live in today, I grew up very much on the outside, the outside of social circles. Having friends was actually a celebration for me because it probably happened one or two times growing up. And as a kid, you expect to be a part of social circles. You expect to be a part of the jokes that people are making, having friends, going to sleepovers, whatever it is. That didn't happen often, if at all. At one point, I'm embarrassed to say it got so bad that I pretended there were fairies in the wall, <laughs> which didn't really work. Um, but as a teenager, I made a vow that if I ever had the power or the ability to do something about it, that I would make sure that no woman or girl ever felt silenced, censored, or otherwise stereotyped. And that followed me through college and into my first adult job at Princeton University, where I was a psychology researcher examining how storytelling and rhetoric affects our memories and our behavior. Now, I have this image up here for a specific reason. I'm gonna ask you to take a second and think back to your memory of 9-11, where you were, what you were doing. And I'll give a second for you to pull that up because I know it's been a while. Okay, so here's the thing. Your memory of 9-11 is not actually the real memory. Oh, um, <laughs> over the years, what you remember as having happened has been interwoven with the stories and experiences of your friends and family that have shared them over the years, as well as whatever you've read in the news or seen in movies or heard from politicians and influencers. And so the memory that you have is really a hybrid one, one that you may think is your own, but actually is pretty far from it. And so as a researcher, as a fresh college graduate, I realized that there was something powerful about being able to decide which stories were being told in order to control a larger narrative. This is where I would insert a diabolical laugh, but I promise that everything I'm doing is for the greater good. So moving on, I decided, you know what? I have all of this information. Let's try media. <laughs> I was still working at Princeton at the time. And I was up at 3 a.m., as we all want to do, right before going to work or school, scrolling through Facebook. And I happened upon the Facebook status of Ariana Huffington, who, if you know, um, used to be the owner of the Huffington Post. And she did, would do this thing 
where she would actually post her email address in her status updates. It's random, but I took a screenshot and I thought, hey, maybe one day I'm going to shoot her an email and let her know how awesome she is. Well, that day came a little sooner than I expected um, because a few months later, <laughs> a news story broke out that was all about Muslim women and whether or not they belonged in feminism. Cue scary like music, right? And, and I'm sitting there watching the news because, you know, obviously I don't have a job. I'm not trying to work to make my bills. Um, sarcasm. I'm sitting there following along and I realized something is missing. And it was a pretty big something. It was Muslim women. Nobody was actually asking Muslim women what their perspective was on them being involved in the feminist movement. So I pulled out Arianna Huffington's email. I think I just had some coffee, so I was feeling super, you know, revved up and I can do this. And I had never been published before. But I was annoyed, I was frustrated, and I was tired of not seeing voices like mine represented. And so I sent her a message. I said, look, I'm Muslim, I'm a woman, I'm a feminist, and I have an opinion about this. And to my surprise, she replied, and I published my first ever article in the Huffington Post. And I posted it to my Facebook. I was like, great, you know, my friends and my family are gonna be so proud of me. This is great, I can check it off my bucket list, back to doing other things. No, the article went viral, and I received thousands of hate comments. Fabulous. And then I got an invitation from HuffPost Live to actually debate a, per a woman on the opposite side of the spectrum. Right? She had a different opinion than me. And so we're doing the debate. And up until that moment, I was slightly suffering from some imposter syndrome wondering why I was the one that had been chosen to debate this person who called herself a feminist. But then it all clicked, because in a moment, she really changed the trajectory of my life forever when she told me that in order for me to continue having a conversation with her, that I would need to take off my headscarf. This was on international streaming, by the way. You have a woman literally telling another woman, both of whom are feminists, that one is going to be silenced unless she removes a piece of her clothing that she has chosen to put on. And so, of course, that was when everything just snapped into place. I ended the debate having annihilated her. Woohoo for me. <laughs> um, but I realized that there was something much larger at play. Why were so many people uncomfortable and jarred by the fact that someone who seemed different was suddenly out on this larger space? Why, was there, why were there so many hate comments? Why was, did she feel comfortable saying that sort of thing? So I decided, why not look into it? And I found some interesting things. In the typical newsroom, 88% of the people there are going to be men specifically white men. Eight to 27% of the folks in the newsroom are characterized as diverse, which is what you check off um, you know, when you're applying to college. The thing that I found most disturbing, however, is that in the newsroom or in media at, at large, six, only 6% 6 of media companies, including the ones that are for women, okay, are run or owned by women. And that's not just a problem that affects media. This is a problem that affects the world at large. Here's why. When you think about the world, even the most complex issues that are going on out there, at the core of every one of those issues is a story. If you look at these numbers, who are the people that are controlling the kinds of stories that we're reading? Who are the people that are controlling the types of perspectives that we're seeing on those stories that we're reading, right? And so that is a systemic issue. And as a natural next step for someone like myself, I decided why not launch my own media company because huzzah! So I started a global media company called The Tempest, which focuses on changing the narrative of diverse millennial women in the world. And the reason I called it The Tempest is number one, Shakespeare is amazing. And number two, 
we're not here to just, you know, publish a few stories, call it a day, and walk away. That's not who I am. That's not what we were looking to do. We weren't looking to make a few ripples. We were looking to create a storm. And what better way to create a storm than to create a tempest? So I figured that that name would fit in pretty well. So here I have this company. I have everything lined up and I have the door open and there is nobody there, crickets. <laughs> I thought that women would be lining up to share their stories. Turns out it took me six weeks to get my first story. And the thing that I heard over and over again from the women that I approached, many of whom weren't writers before this, was that they felt that their voices didn't matter, that their story wasn't important. It wasn't a story that others would be interested in reading. And so with that understanding, I realized something. When you look at the world around you and you don't see your stories reflected in the news that you're consuming and the movies that you're watching, or if you look at the people that are being represented, if none of that looks like you, then why would you think that you matter? And that was something that even though, you know, we were extremely excited and we got that first story, and a year later now we have millions of readers from across the globe. We have over a thousand women writing for us from more than 20 countries on every topic under the sun and a fantastic global team of contributors and team members. Um, super happy and excited about that. Not everything is a bushel of roses. Cue this great media coverage. Last summer, I was picked to be uh, a member of a small government task force seeking to create cohesive cultural change in both communities and America as a whole. Now, when the report was released, a massive attack was unleashed on me specifically out of all of the members on the committee because the far alt-right was not happy with the fact that someone with my identity, with my background, would be on a task force working for the US government and working for the US as a whole. And so I got everything from death threats to hate mail to really flattering media coverage. And we kept the company running, but during that time, I am not going to pretend that I was amazing and having the best time of my life. I was actually terrified for my life. Um, and there were some points where, you know, it, it was really hard to get up, but I realized something that I could not allow these folks to silence me. I could not allow these people to silence the thousands of women that were seeking to get their stories out there and tell their stories exactly as they wanted to tell them. Because there was something bigger at work here. And that something is the fact that the world today, if you think about it, has divided us very strategically into different groups. We're all about what makes us different, what makes us special, what makes those people different, well, who we should hate, who we should be attracted to. All of these different norms have made us uncomfortable to engage with people that we perceive as the other. But the funny thing is, is that when you look at neuroscience, you find that they've that the social connection is actually a potent thing for human beings. And we've quite literally been stripped of that ability because of our fear of what's different. And so it, it makes it so much harder because the problem, uh, there's a problem that arises, right? If you are uncomfortable having conversations that are about topics that you might not be comfortable with, with people that you might not be familiar with, then there's no progress. And when there's no progress, you're not challenging the norm. When you're not challenging the norm, then you are continuing to silence a group of people. A group of people, by the way, that makes up 51% of the world known as women. And so that is kind of an issue, I think, a little bit. And when you kind of look at what's going on, this sort of lack of challenging the norm has become the new normal. How many of you actually see yourselves in the media that you consume, in the news that you read, in the movies that you watch, in the politics that's being currently litigated? I would reckon that it's very few, if at all. And that's an issue, because when people are then uncomfortable with seeing those that are different, 
like I was the person that was different last summer, then there, that discomfort is going to create a kind of reaction that isn't too great. And that's a bit of an issue. That's why I'm here, though. That's why the Tempest does the work that we do. We're really here to cha challenge the status quo, to disrupt an otherwise static media landscape. Instead of tokenizing or othering minorities and women, we're here to normalize and allow them to share their experiences exactly as they want them to be shared. Because I believe that the mission behind it is really to democratize access to media and then elevating otherwise silenced voices that you can shift the direction of media and as a result, shift society and politics and policies in the world as a whole. So what's the big secret? The big secret is to amplify women's voices. Because when you start to include people, when you start to feel like you belong, that you're accepted, then that actually starts a ripple effect, an effect in which you are beginning to influence decisions that are being made about the types of movies that are being created, about the types of policies that are being written, about the media that you're reading. And that's extremely powerful. That's something that the world really doesn't want us to know about. And once you start knowing that, that's when you can really create a difference. So because we remember the world through stories, here's a little tidbit for you. Your voice matters. And if you belong to 51% of the world's population, your voice matters that much more. Because at the end of the day, it's not about silencing a group of people. It's about elevating everyone's voices. That's really how we can take over the world. Thank you.